Welcome to DevConf, welcome um, to our session. So my name is Victor, this is Artem. We're both from Red Hat, from the core kernel team. And uh, we'd like to tell you something about what happened in, in the BPF world in the past, let's say, one, two years. Um, let me start with some, a bit of statistics. You can see the number of uh, commits and the number of changes uh, in the BPF subsystem in the kernel throughout the past two years. And you can clearly see that the trend is rising. So BPF is really getting a lot of attention upstream. There's a lot of new work uh, appearing practically every day. Uh, when we, at the beginning, when we set up this talk, we put down everything that we found interesting that happened in the past two years. And the overall talk took like something more than one hour. So we had to pretty much cut it to less than a half to match the uh, match the, t uh, the schedule. So we won't be covering everything, but we'll be covering the most interesting parts from our point, uh, uh, point of view, uh, which are especially interesting to people who try to develop their BPF applications. So maybe let me first start um, with a quick poll. How many of you have ever written a BPF application in any, any sort, in some framework, whatever? Okay, not much? Cool. Um, so this talk will be quite technical, so hopefully you have at least some basic knowledge of BPF. Uh, let me first uh, maybe do a quick recapitulation. What is BPF or eBPF? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use these two terms like one. Today, eBPF equals BPF. So basically, it's an in-kernel, let's say, virtual machine, which allows you to run your own programs inside the kernel with kernel privileges. Those programs are written uh, using so-called BPF inst instructions. It's a special language for that. And one of the most interesting parts about this is that there's a component called BPF Verifier, which checks every program that you try to load into the BPF subsystem, into the kernel. And uh, it checks that the program that you're trying to run, or you will be running, is safe to be run inside the kernel. So it doesn't crash the kernel, obviously. It doesn't uh, hang the kernel, so the program must terminate, and so on. This is quite a strict component, and we'll be talking uh, about it uh, a lot today, so that's why I'm mentioning it. So once you have your eBPF program uh, loaded into the kernel, you can attach it to various events in the kernel, such as uh, k-probes, sockets for some network uh, filtering, C groups, and so on. There are so many probes uh, that you can, or there are so many events that you can attach BPF programs to uh, these days. Um, okay, I'm gonna, or we're gonna uh, split the talk into several parts. And the first part is uh, we'd like to introduce you some new features that you have as BPF program developers uh, that you have uh, available uh, and you can use to write your BPF programs or you enhance your BPF programs. So first of all, one of the most interesting things that happened in past uh, years in BPF are so-called BPF kernel functions. Uh, if you've ever written uh, a BPF program, you probably know that uh, it's not easy to call kernel functions from BPF programs. You can't call anything, because obviously that would be too dangerous. So uh, the first way to approach this uh, are so-called BPF helpers, where the kernel, kernel contains uh, a list of functions which are allowed to be called uh, from BPF programs. Uh, they were quite difficult to be added, so the, the, the list of uh, helpers didn't grow much throughout the time, but there was found that uh, uh, there's a necessity to, to come up with new functions that can be called from BPF programs. That's why the concept of BPF kernel functions uh, was created, which are much more easy to create uh, and edit. Uh, you basically just need to annotate the function inside a kernel with this special annotation and register the function for the correct program type, and you can then call the function from your BPF programs. Uh, one of the nice things about KFUNS is that uh, the verifier, uh, they allow the verifier to perform additional checks uh, so that it can check that usage of these functions is safe inside your BPF program. Uh, this is done through, again, another annotations. I will be showing an example of those in the, in the next section. Um, Maybe an example would be great. So uh, we have one example, uh, by the way, which was written by Artem here, uh, where uh, he added a new kfunk for uh, calling the crash k exec function. Uh, it was as simple as this. So he basically added this function to some uh, list of uh, functions, and then this list of functions is registered to be 
uh, allowed to be called from certain type of BPF programs. What this allows you to do is that you can, uh, when you're writing your BPF program, you just declare this function as extern, and then you can actually easily call it from your BPF program, which means, in this case, you can crash the kernel from your BPF program. Sounds interesting. Is that any, any way useful? Well, quite, quite yes, because you can crash the kernel in a controlled way. You can let your BPF program simulate some situation that, hap that, that can happen in production, then crash the kernel, which will obviously give you a crash dump, and you can then analyze that crash dump afterwards and maybe find some problem that you wouldn't be able to simulate otherwise. So this is one of the use cases for, uh, for KFUNCs. Um, another concept of, uh, that, that appeared in BPF recently are so-called reference pointers. Um, one of the problems is that uh, work, uh, the, um, BPF programs work with pointers is complicated because the verifier had to check every time that the pointer, uh, the reference ticket point, you can only access memory which is available to you. Uh, and uh, there have been a lot of problems with uh, accessing memory from BPF programs. One of the ways to approach it uh, are uh, so called reference pointers which uh, are actually implemented using the KFUNCs, that, that's why I started with them, and that basically uh, allow uh, KFUNCs, or functions from the kernel that your BPF program is calling, uh, to return you a pointer which you can then dereference and uh, use it uh, to access memory. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, these functions. Uh, one are um, annotated with uh, the acquire uh, annotation, which says that this KFUNCs is returning a reference pointer, and then the other one uh, is tagged with the release annotation, which says that this KFUNCs is uh, releasing a reference pointer. These work roughly the same as the references in other languages, so uh, the verifier, or there's a component which is counting the references to the pointers, and you can be sure that the pointer is not freed, or the pointed memory is not freed during the time you have acquired this pointer. If you didn't have this, uh, every access to memory from a BPF program had to be done through a special BPF call, which would register an exception handler because the memory could have been freed and so on. This mechanism allows a much easier and straightforward access to memory by actually holding a reference to the pointed memory, which uh, prevents that memory to be freed in the meantime while, while you hold this reference. Um, so as I said, the verifier is checking that this reference is always valid. Um, but one of the problems that be, uh, was created by this is what if you want to acquire a pointer and then you want to use it from a, a different BPF program? Is that even possible? Luckily, it is. Uh, by yet another concept of so-called long-lived kernel pointers, which are new kind of BPF pointers, which have several features, such as they must be strongly typed, uh, they are returned by the KFUNCs or by the helpers, and that may be stored inside BPF maps, which is the most important feature, because then you can acquire a pointer, uh, you can store it inside a map, another BPF program can pick up the pointer from the map and dereference it and use that memory, and you can be still sure that the memory is not freed in the meantime. Um, actually, there are two kinds of uh, long-lived pointers. Uh, there are the reference ones, which, which are more, more important uh, or interesting, but there are also unreferenced, which still can be only accessed with probability. So this is basically plain pointers without reference counting, which you can just store into the maps, but you, can, you have to still use this special probe call to access the, the memory. However, you can also use the reference pointer inside maps. Uh, they can be safely dereferenced without probe read, and uh, they are automatically destroyed once the map is freed, which is the nice part. So there's sort of automatic garbage uh, cleaning. You have a pointer, uh, you, you, you acquire it, you pass it to a, a different BPF program through a map, then this program works with it, then it doesn't free, it doesn't matter, because uh, once the map holding the pointer is, uh, is freed, the pointer will be automatically destroyed. Um, okay, uh, as I said, there will be a lot of technicalities in this, and this will be quite packed, so sorry if I'm, if I'm going too far, oh, sorry, uh, too fast. 
Uh, anyway, another concept that has always been troublesome in BPF is iteration. As I said at the beginning, one of the things that BPF uh, verifier is checking is that uh, the, your BPF programs do not hang. They must always terminate. Uh, this is a problem. It's been approached in a different ways throughout history. First of all, we basically said there can be no loops in, BP, uh, in BPF programs, which works, it's efficient. However, it's quite too constraining, as you can imagine. The second uh, approach was we allowed to unroll loops by the compiler, which works again, but it's quite impractical. So another thing that came up was uh, that the BPF subsystem allowed fixed iteration loop, uh, loops. So loops that had a known number of iterations, but still they were quite difficult to verify because the verifier had to, uh, had to uh, walk every path through that loop, every program path through the loop, and check that uh, indeed the number of iterations is still fixed. So one of the more, most recent things that appeared in BPF is this BPF loop helper, which resolved this problem because uh, it, it's a new helper which has this, uh, this annotation, which basically uh, you pass it a number of iterations and you pass it a, a callback function and it will execute this callback function the number of iteration times for you, which means that this is something that is very, very easy to verify because the execution is not inside the BPF program. The execution is handled by the BPF subsystem itself. So if you can verify that the callback function terminates, then automatically your, your loop terminates. And this is a very elegant and much uh, simple to verify way of writing loops in today BPF programs. Um, another thing that uh, is problematic is that sometimes you want to iterate things that don't have a known number of items but you know that they are finite. For instance, you want to execute some BPF program for every process running in your system. You don't know how many processes are there. What you know is that there's a finite number of processes and this will terminate. Uh, to resolve this, there is this concept of BPF iterators. It had been uh, around for a while, which are some special probes which are not attached to events, but they are executed for each kernel object of certain time. For instance, for each task, for each file, for each VMA, etc., etc. What is a new thing about BPF iterators are so-called generic iterators, which allow you to very easily add new iterable objects uh, by a concept which is very similar to uh, iterators in, for instance, C++, where you just specify these four things. First of all, you define a structure which will hold the iterator state. And then you just define three functions, one for creating the iterator, one for getting the next item in the iterator, and one for destroying the iterator once your iteration is done. And this way, just by registering these four functions, you can create a new iterable object inside the kernel. Quite an elegant thing. Um, so last thing in my part is uh, this multilink attachment feature that has appeared uh, in, in the past year or two. Um, one of the problems uh, of BPF programs is that they sometimes take, uh, take time to attach, especially if you're trying to attach one BPF program to many events, such as to all the syscalls. There are some 300 and something syscalls on standard machines, and if you want to attach one BPF program to mm, happen any time a syscall is hit, uh, it can take some time. So there is this new link type uh, BPF trace caper multi, uh, and uh, this concept is implemented using F probes, which is a bit similar to K probes, if you know K probes in, in the kernel, uh, but it's built on top of F trace. Uh, the difference from K probes is that it's available only for, for function entries and exits, uh, uh, so you cannot attach to arbitrary instructions, uh, but it, will, it allows you to very quickly attach to multiple functions. I have an uh, example here. Uh, where this is the, uh, I'm using the BPF trace uh, tool to attach to all the syscalls. You can see it's some 400 to, uh, 426 probes. And uh, while it took some 15 seconds to attach in the past version, with these new, uh, with these new uh, probes, it takes less than a second to attach. So a major, major speed up uh, when, uh, for, for um, tools or programs that you want to attach uh, to many, many probes. Uh, okay, that's everything from my part. We'll have to pass the mic, so if you have uh, a one quick, we can ask one quick question while we'll do it. Uh, 
Unmute. Does it work? Yeah. OK, uh, so now let's talk about a bit about uh, BPF inner workings. Uh, first, I'll talk about memory management. And there were a couple of interesting developments here. Uh, first is BPF-specific memory allocator and allocated objects and link lists that it enables. And another one is BPF proc pack allocator. Uh, BPF-specific memory allocator was introduced by Alexei Servoitov, and it's used for dynamic allocation of memory in BPF programs. Obviously, there, is, there are already a number of uh, memory allocators in kernel, but none suited BPF programs well. And that is because um, memory allocation in kernel uh, depends heavily on the context it, it's ran from. And BPF programs, especially the tracing ones, can be run from any context, including uh, NMIs. Um, so um, it's a common problem with memory allocation, and there are common ways to deal with it. One is known as uh, memory pools. And the idea is you pre-cache some memory in, in a non-restrictive context, and then use it when, when the time comes. So PPF memory allocator does exactly that. It creates uh, optionally per CPU caches of, of objects of predefined size, and manages them through IRQ work, which is a re uh, relaxed context. Uh, one of the issues with um, memory pools uh, is mm -hmm. over overextended memory, using more memory than is needed at the time. So Alexei tried to uh, remedy this with high and low watermarks to keep the number of uh, cached objects low. The interface is pretty simple. You get basically two pairs, one to work with uh, variable size uh, objects, and another one with predefined size. And as you, can, as you might have seen, uh, this needs a reference to struct BPF memalloc, and you need to initialize it in advance and destroy it when you're done. Um, you can define whether you want it to be per CPU cache or not, and the size of, of the objects. OK, there are some real life applications already. Uh, the page set that introduced this uh, allocator also switched hash map implementation, dynamic hash map impl implementation to use it. And it claims 10 times uh, faster dynamic allocations now. It also allows sleeping and tracing progr BPF programs to use dynamic hash maps, which wasn't possible before. A bit later, another uh, page set switched BPF local storage to use uh, this new allocator. And that fixed a uh, deadlock problem uh, when BPF local storage was used from tracing programs. Um, it was caused by uh, lock contention KMLEC. And one of the most important uh, things that it enabled is allocated objects and linked lists. So just a couple of months after uh, BPF, object, uh, BPF allocator was uh, introduced, another page set was posted. And basically, that allowed uh, introduced allocated objects and linked lists. The former allow BPF programs uh, to define their own, uh, to allocate their own objects of a type in the program BTF, B BTF and, uh, and basically enable them to build complex data structures uh, flexibly. Uh, the former introduced linked lists that are single ownership and they can be put into maps or dislocated objects and hold such objects as elements. As is usual with BPF, everything is verifier checked. Uh, so they're supposed to be safe, at least from the verifier standpoint. Uh, unfortunately, interfaces for these are currently experimental, so I'm not going to show any. But if you want a head start, uh, you can look for examples in self-test BPF directory. And also in that directory, you can find the BPF experimental that H uh, header file, which is kind of a staging ground for these in development APIs. Uh, next is BPF proc pack allocator. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I had to cut it almost completely. Uh, but the good news is that it's very well covered by WN. And if it sounds interesting, I encourage you to go through these articles. They're very well written. Uh, the idea of BPF proc pack allocator is to first save some memory. Uh, but, and that is achieved by packing multiple BPF programs into a single page. Before this, every single BPF program was using a, a whole 
page, memory page. On x86, um, memory page is four kilobytes, and that is way more than um, a, a usually a BPF, BPF program is. It also tried to improve performance by using huge pages and easing up TLB pressure, but due to bugs found in this patch set and also in, in, in previous uh, patches that this patch set uncovered, it is not the case. And as of now, BPF proc pack allocator is, in, is merged and working, but it only packs uh, BPF programs into a single normal page. This also inspired uh, some work on generic executable memory allocators. And the first attempt wasn't that successful because it, uh, it wasn't available on all architectures. And another important uh, user executable memory in kernel is kernel modules. So it couldn't be used for that. So that's why uh, it, it was decided not to merge it. But just a couple of uh, weeks before this talk, another attempt was, post was posted. It is called JIT slash text allocator. And it is currently under, under discussion. Uh, there are obviously some concerns, but it looks much better. <laughs> another topic is BPF program signing. Uh, this is a long list of small improvements, and it started a long time ago. The first page set was posted on April 2022, uh, and we're still not there. BPF programs might look uh, similar to kernel modules at first glance. They're both stored on disk as L files. They both require relocations. They both require memory allocation and so on. But there is one important difference, and that is in case of kernel modules, kernel does all the work, it understands the structure completely, it does, does everything. And in case of BPF, libbpf does a lot. Uh, so by the time the code gets into memory, it might be very different from what was on disk, thus invalidating the signature. So to achieve programs, BPF program signing, kernel needs to do more. And there were a couple of approaches to this. Uh, most of these were discarded, or the first two. Uh, first was trying to move the whole libbpf into the kernel, and that didn't work because it's big and unwieldy. Uh, then there was a, an idea to imp implement a new file format that would be understood by the kernel, which was um, dropped in favor of new BPF program type, which probably was easier to get into mainline. So to understand what kernel needs to do, we need to understand what libbpf does. Its processes can be split into four main phases, but only the first two are important in terms of program signing. Uh, the open phase is where the object file is parsed uh, and where libbpf learns about programs maps, um, external functions, and so on. And the second phase is where the code changes actually occur. Uh, here, uh, libbpf uh, probes kernel features, uh, applies relocations, creates maps, and so on. Everything needs to be done by the kernel. Uh, one of the places where code changes occur is map creation. Mm. Before this change, uh, BPF programs accepts, accessed maps through map file descriptors, but those could, be, could only be uh, determined on, on load on, when, when the maps are created. So instead of uh, referencing them directly, another abstraction was added, and which is file descriptor arrays. So now BPF programs uh, reference indexes in these arrays, and the arrays are populated during program load. Another introduction is loader programs. So you might know that everything BPF related in kernel is done through what a single sysbpf syscall. Uh, the first argument is, is a common idea, and there's like 32 of them. So everything, uh, map creation, program loading, attaching, uh, BDF lookups, everything is done through this syscall. And the net result of libbpf is a list of these syscalls. The idea was to write those down and play them back when, when the time comes. And to do that, a new BPF program type was introduced which could only call the sysbpf syscall and also sysclose and could only be ran from user context. 
but it's still a BPF program and we still need to load it. That, that, that's where light skeletons come in. Mm, the normal workflow with leave BPF is that you create some BPF programs, put it in a C file, compile it, get an object file. That object file then gets parsed by BPF tool and you get a skeleton header file. That skeleton header file contains the whole original uh, ELF object file and it also contains structures uh, describing maps and programs and so on and it also contains a multiple multiple functions to work with those to load attach and so on and then you take that header file include it in your user space program and work it work with it through this uh, the light skeleton is different in that it does not uh, contain the original L file instead it includes the logger program that also means that we don't need libbpf or libelf uh, headers anymore. So your user space program would not depend on those. Uh, for your user space program, the change is almost invisible uh, because they're interchangeable. The only thing is you can't not use libbpf uh, functions anymore. And in most cases, that means that you'll need to change the way you access map and program file descriptors because usually they access through libbpf functions, now you access them through, uh, through the skeleton structure. All of this was just one single page set, but it still missed a couple of important things. One is core support. Uh, it is very important because it allows for greater uh, BPF portability. Uh, in this case, the full uh, source file that implemented it was changed so that it could be compiled for both kernel and user space. And this allowed to get more BPF programs uh, through Light Skeleton and allowed to remove the BPF dependency from BPF preload UMD. BPF preload is a number of BPF programs that are bundled with the kernel. Uh, this also enables languages such as Go uh, to, uh, to, to use it, the, the full advantages of Core. Uh, uh, before that, they couldn't because they don't, can't adopt uh, libbpf for, for whatever reason. And the last thing is light skeleton in the kernel. So instead of including light skeleton in your user space program, you can include it in kernel now. And this allowed to drop user mode driver from bpf preload completely. And that means now we have uh, bpf code in a kernel module, which can be signed. So we get bpf signed code. Well, only kind of. Uh, because it's a module, it lacks portability, and so we are still away from, uh, from true BPF signing. But I hope next time we talk about this, it will be there. That's it from my part. So questions? Yep. Yep. Well, kernel documentation, I think. <laughs> kernel documentation, actually, one of the important parts that we missed. Uh, the, the question was, what is the best source of information about BPF? Uh, important parts we missed. Uh, during this last year, a lot of commits were, uh, were devoted to, kernel, to documentation. So documentation directory in, in kernel is, is very good now. Uh, Yeah, so uh, there are also books on this uh, by, by, by the authors. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm asking specifically about the light like, thing. Is it <coughs> yeah, the latest greatest is, is kernel source tree. Yeah. So there. And self test directory. Yep. Yeah. You, <laughs> Uh, can you repeat the question? What, what's the difference between k-props and k-functions? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, you're speaking about BBF trace tool specifically, right? So the k-props are the standard. Uh, they depend on which kernel mechanism they use to attach to the functions. k-props use the k-probe mechanism, which has been in kernel for, for a while, uh, while the k-funks, which are 
unfortunately named the same as the k-functions in kernel, but they are a different thing. So the k-functions in BPF trace uh, map to f entry, f exit uh, probe types or program types in BPF, which is a uh, which are special BPF uh, BPF special probes that allow you to attach to the beginning or to the end of a function. Uh, they are much quicker than k-probes. Uh, they have some more advantages, such as access to function arguments and so on, because they leverage on the BPF type information, BTF. So the question was, uh, the BPF loop helper introduces an indirect call, uh, which is generally viewed as a not uh, very good thing in, in, in the kernel because it can introduce many problems. And the question was if BPF is doing uh, something uh, to mitigate those, if I got it correctly. Yeah, specifically for the performance perspective. Yeah, specifically for the performance perspective. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I don't have that much insight into uh, into this uh, to know. I guess yes. Uh, I expect that, uh, that they are uh, employing some mechanisms, but I don't know of any particular one. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, the question is uh, if there are any limits to stack depth in BPF programs. Am I correct? There is. So one of the things is that uh, the BPF stack is quite limited. It's like 512 bytes in total. Um, and I, I don't know the exact limit, but there is a limit on, on, on the stack depth that you, you can have. It's checked by the verifier. Uh, the limits in general are uh, quite strict uh, in, uh, in the verifier, often more strict than developers would want them to be. So the question is, uh, since BPF uh, uh, acts sort of like a virtual machine inside a kernel, what is the overhead of, uh, of executing BPF programs? And spe specifically with tracing, what is the difference using BPF programs for tracing than kernel tracing? So basically, it's called a VM, and the programs are called that they are just in time compiled by, but basically, uh, there's the translation from BPF instructions into native instructions is usually one-to-one. -one -one. I would say so. The uh, the overhead is just basically looking into a table, which tells you which instruction to to convert it to for the specific architecture. So the air overhead is like very very close to zero. Okay, and we're out of time. Um, so thank you for the attention. Th thank you for coming. If you have any other questions, just feel free to grab us on the on the corridors and discuss more. Thank you. <laughs>